I thought I would bring the nation's preeminent expert on the program to discuss this yet again. Barack Obama knows nothing about guns, about the Second Amendment, about gun control, about any of the statistics related to it. Like everything else, he's driven by ideology. John Lott, President, Crime Prevention Research Center. How are you, sir? Doing great. Good to talk to you again, Mark. John, uh, good to talk to you. Uh, Before we get started, I want to remind people that uh, for a brief period of time, you and Obama taught at the same university. Please explain. Right. Well, we were, for a period of four years, we overlapped. Uh, He was a part-time lecturer there, and I... uh, Well, let's stop right there. So he wasn't a full-fledged tenure professor, was he, at the University of Chicago? No. I mean, people knew when he was brought on that it was just a temporary position. Uh, In fact, uh, there were some senior faculty that were concerned that people might be attempting to get him a regular position. And it was made clear that he was going to be running for public office and that... uh, This was a way station. Right. That having a part-time lectureship allowed him a lot of time to be able to go out and campaign. And Mm. uh, he didn't have to do research because he wasn't going to try to publish anything and so you know teaching three hours a week uh preparing for that class the rest of the time he could go and uh and campaign and your dealings with him because you knew him you met with him you weren't fast friends obviously what was he like uh he's pretty cold i mean he uh he was someone that if he disagreed with you, uh, you got the impression that he really viewed you as evil. And I don't think he liked me particularly. In fact, I know he Did, didn't. I mean, it was just, didn't. look, obviously I was very conservative on any of the college campuses I've been on. and um, I'm, But I'm used to people disagreeing with me. I mean, you may have 90%, it would seem, of uh, the faculty being liberal at many of these places, but at least a lot of them enjoy debating with you. So, you know, people that you know, like Cass Sunstein, um, I don't agree with Cass on hardly anything, but we had Cass over for dinner a number of times. He'd come over, we'd argue, we'd be still arguing four hours later, you know. And uh, But it was the process that he enjoyed. But Obama wasn't like that at all. Obama, if he disagreed with you, and I assume he didn't think he could get anything from you. He just was rude. I'll give you one example I don't think I've told you about before, and that is uh, he never went to the seminars, really, except for one time. And uh, it was a well, What does time. that mean? What seminars? Well, faculty have seminars where somebody comes in and gives a paper, and the faculty okay. listen and they ask questions. And uh, Obama asked a question. And I don't think hardly anybody understood the question. I thought I might understand it. And uh, and so when we were kind of getting in line for lunch, I was standing next to him. And I said, uh, I thought it was an interesting question, but I thought maybe it might have been clearer to the speaker if he had. And then before I could even finish, um, he just turned his back on me. You know, that was kind of it. You know, he just he wasn't even interested in talk. I was just trying to be helpful at the time and uh... it's the way he treats say Netanyahu right probably uh... Mm -hmm. it just you know there were times when I'd run into him kind of outside of the campus down in Hyde Park and you'd try to reach out and shake hands just like you would anybody from the faculty and you know he just he wouldn't do it he just would ignore you just walk by and Mm -hmm. it was I just try to be friendly with people, but he, uh, he he would have nothing of it. So back in the 2008 campaign, when you and I first started talking about this, I'd gotten a call from a New York Times reporter because she was doing a story about Obama back at the University of Chicago, and uh, people would say, oh, you got to talk to Lot. So uh, she called me up, and I tried to explain these types of things to her, but Obama's campaign just denied any of it had happened, and so the New York Times didn't include any of the stuff that was in there. But it was, uh, I mean, I must talk to her for like an hour and a half or something. Well, of course, he didn't fit the uh, template, and they're the Praetorian media, and they're not going to touch their man. John Lott, you've given us insight into Obama, and it underscores what most of us have thought about him as we've observed him. He said today he's been president seven and a half years. By my calculation, he's been president closer to six and a half years. Right. Yeah, I, All right, anyway, 
I want to get into this gun stuff because it's important. He keeps saying over and over and over again, we're the only Western uh, country that has these mass shootings. Can you address that, please? Well, I mean, if you adjust for population size, I mean, we have about 320 million people in the United States, most European countries. You know, you may have Germany, which may be 80 million, but a lot of countries, maybe 4 million or 8 million. Yeah, we, we have the population maybe of all Western Europe put together. Right, exactly. And so, I mean, they're a little bit bigger than we are if you put all the countries of Western Europe together, but it's, or, or Europe together, but it's, but, you know, it's similar. And so, if you do it on a per capita rate, Europe actually has a mass public shooting rate fairly similar to the rate that we have here in the United States. And there are nine countries uh, that have a higher rate per capita than we have. You know, uh, you have uh, Norway has had the worst mass public shooting by an individual. They had, if you ignore the bombing deaths, they had 67 people killed and 110 wounded in the attack. And does uh, Norway ban weapons or have very uh, uh, strict limits on weapons? Well, the handgun that was used in the attack was banned. And, Let me just uh, get that straight. So the handgun was banned, and the guy slaughtered with a variety of weapons uh, 67, 68 human beings. It was mainly with the handgun that he killed most of the people. But, and uh, they were unarmed, and he just kept loading it up, didn't he? That's exactly right. He went to a place where it was an island, and he figured he'd have free reign for a while because nobody else would have a weapon there, and he took advantage of the situation. You're, you can look at Germany. Germany has had uh, two of the five worst public school shootings for K-12 through schools. Uh, they have a third one that would get them in the top six. And what are Germany's uh, handgun laws like? Well, in this case, they were used. Uh, he used a semi-automatic rifle, but that was banned. And he, in order to get a, he didn't. The, the killers in these cases did not legally obtain their weapons. To legally obtain a weapon in Germany, you have to go through two psychological screening tests. You essentially have to hire a lawyer to go and and get it, and you can end up with a single-shot rifle where you have to manually load it. Uh, uh, each time you're going to fire a bullet. That's so where did this weapon. guy get his weapon from? He got it on the black market. On the black market, all, all, right? All, all three of the guys apparently got their guns illegally. Mm -hmm. and, and by the uh, way, if we were to outlaw guns in our country, just outlaw them, right? we can't even stop people from coming across the border. We can't stop drugs from coming across the border. How in the world are we going to stop weapons and ammunition from coming across the border? You, you phrased it exactly right. Look, he, let's say tomorrow you could, or right now, we could click our fingers and cause all illegal drugs to disappear from the country and all guns. How long do you think it would be before illegal drugs started coming back in? And how long do you think it would be before those drug gangs would start bringing in guns again to protect that valuable property? It's not like they can go and call up the police and say this other drug gang stole our valuable drugs. Can you help get them back for us? They have to go and set up their own militaries, and the same time they're going to bring in the drugs, they're going to bring in the weapons that they need to protect them. And what most people don't realize is how much of our violence in the United States is drug gang related or gang related. The Obama administration itself, in a report that came out in 2009, claimed, I think this may be a little bit high, but they were saying that 80% of violent crime in the United States was gang related and that's primarily drug gangs and what are they doing about that well not a lot nothing I would think and uh, i don't even believe he had a seminar at the white house about it you know he holds these seminars but apparently that doesn't uh, that doesn't rate but right. you know i i've asked myself repeatedly and i've said it on the air these people come forward the politicians jump on this stuff they're like vultures they move immediately you know they want to deny us of our bill of rights and so forth and I say to myself, well, go ahead and propose a law. Can we read what it is that you would propose that would stop this nut job from murdering these people? They never do it. Right. Well, there, there are two points to make. One is the laws that they have talked about, uh, you know, uh, these expanded background checks. When you see the support in the polls, it varies dramatically when you actually put a bill forward. So when you had the, the Toomey Mansion bill that was there, Polls on that actually indicated that a majority of people opposed those laws. They were actually happy when it didn't get through the Senate. But when you have these kind of 
artificially written, you know, poles that uh, kind of paint some ideal there and don't mention the costs that may be involved in these and the problems that are associated with these laws, you know, they get much higher poll numbers. The second thing is, again yesterday, even before we knew the facts about how the individual had obtained the gun, now we know, but the law that the president's been pushing wouldn't have stopped this. In fact, Oregon already has the law that uh, that Obama wants to have pushed. But the amazing thing is it's just not yesterday's attack. Every one of the public statement cases that Obama's made a public statement about, in that one single case, would the laws that he's been pushing have stopped even one of these cases? And yet he keeps on going out, even before we know the facts, saying, you know, we got to do something now. But uh, if I was a reporter, I would just ask him, Name me one of these cases that you've talked about that would have been actually stopped by the laws that you're putting forward. It's also interesting now they point to Australia. Australia confiscated their guns from their citizens, didn't they? Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. What happened was, in 96 and 97, they had a gun buyback. Uh, now, you had to sell certain guns there, but then... Uh, and it reduced the number of legally owned guns by about 33%. But then they put licenses in, and people were able to go and buy guns again. And the gun ownership right now in Australia is actually back to where it was before the buyback. And so if, if gun control advocates are correct, what you should have seen then is a big, sharp drop in something like suicides or different types of crime, and then an increase over time. And that's not what you've observed. And one of the big things they point out is firearm suicides. And they have fallen, but at a constant rate. And they were falling for a decade and a half prior to uh, to the gun 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 buyback. In fact, at the same rate, you can't even see any change in the slope going down there. But let me give you some more examples. Some people may be convicted of crimes or plea to certain crimes that have absolutely nothing to do with violence. Oh, sure, right. And they are denied a weapon, at least for a period of time. Right, that's a different group of people. I mean, misdemeanors can deny you being able to buy a gun for life, certain misdemeanors. And so, and one can talk about whether that should be uh, permanent. Now now we're running into situations where you have 4.2 million people on, on Social Security that the Obama administration want to classify as mentally defective because they go and get help on uh, on their finances. So if my mom, who's in her 80s, has my sister uh, go and handle paying her bills on the computer because my mom doesn't want to do it, and my sister has to get power of attorney and stuff to take care of all this stuff, my mom could get classified as mentally defective and be unable to go and purchase a gun for self-defense. Listen, listen, that, that's because we have a wave of 85-year-olds going around shooting people. Well, I'm, Obama sees the future better than I do on this, I guess. But John Lott, you're terrific. Is there a place where people can find you quickly? Yeah. Crimeresearch.org. 